Welcome back to the Drunk on Writing Stephen King Dissection Series. I feel like it's been a while, but like I said, we're back. And today, thanks in part to the patronage of Aria North, we are diving into the 1982 novel slash collection, The Gunslinger. It's adaptation published by Marvel Comics and depending on how I'm feeling, the 2017 film The Dark Tower, which somewhat very loosely adapts portions of this story. We'll see how much I want to talk about that though, because it honestly kind of really annoys me. For now though, uh, a friendly reminder, if you enjoy this episode, please be sure to like it, please subscribe to the channel, please head on over to drunkonwriting.com and help the channel grow or sign up for exclusive items, including exclusive episodes, collector's items, physical things that you can only get through drunkonwriting.com and a ton, ton more behind the scenes videos, uh, you know, exclusive stuff, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, but you're here and I want you to enjoy this episode. So uh, let's just jump in by, you know, going back a moment. You see, I called this a novel slash collection, right? Right at the beginning there. And I did that because it really is both of those. See, the five titles that comprise The Gunslinger, The Gunslinger, The Waystation, The Oracle and the Mountains, The Slow Mutants, and The Gunslinger and the Dark Man, which was later retitled The Gunslinger and the Man in Black, were originally published as short stories in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction between October 1978 and November 1981. In 1982, they were collected in a limited edition. And while the stories, which, you know, we'll dig really into in just a few minutes, were connected in their original kind of short story forms, this limited edition really brought them together. This is the version that I read originally, years ago. It was actually a copy of the 1988 paperback edition of this version. And when I did it, it was at the start of a complete read through of the entire Dark Tower saga, which was something of an issue because that version the uh, the original short stories combined into that very first novelization it compared to the rest of the book it just didn't really hold up in in many ways it simply didn't connect which is not something you want to hear about the launch of the very first book of what is meant to be a huge saga imagine if the first star wars movie just didn't really connect or really didn't set the tone for what was going to come after in his forward to the 2003 version of The Gunslinger, which is the version that I read today, uh, that I read for this dissection, Stephen King agrees with me, agrees with this assessment, assessment that that 1982 version simply didn't dovetail properly into the books that followed. And he had this to say about The Gunslinger in, in his forward to that edition. Um, offer, the, the, he gave these details as to why he felt he needed to make the revisions that he did. In the hiatus between the editorial work on Volume 5 of The Dark Tower, Wolves of the Kala, and Volume 6, Song of Susanna, I decided the time had come to go back to the beginning and start the final overall revisions. Why? Because these seven volumes were never really separate stories at all, but sections of a single long novel called The Dark Tower, and the beginning was out of sync with the ending. When I look back at the first volume, three obvious truths presented themselves. The first was that The Gunslinger had been written by a very young man and had all the problems of a very young man's book. The second was that it contained a great many errors and false starts, particularly in light of the volumes that followed. The third was that The Gunslinger did not even sound like the later books. It was, frankly, rather difficult to read. All too often I heard myself apologizing for it and telling people that if they persevered, they would find the story really found its voice in the drawing of the three. Which, yes, is exactly how I felt in my original read-through of the series. The Gunslinger was, eh, it was fine. But the drawing of the three, that was amazing. And the books that followed, you know, they, they had their highs and lows. But this 2003 revision, again, this is the version that I read today. Having read it, I have to say, it is substantially better. Which I'm very happy to say, because King added over 9,000 words to this edition, about 35 pages worth of new content. Though, 
as King put it in the forward, if you have read the Gunslinger before, you'll only find two or three totally new scenes here. I felt like there was a good amount added, but yeah, he's probably correct. It's mostly little tidbits, but here's uh, King's summary of the changes. Uh, it's actually a relatively short, short summary. He wrote, I was not surprised to find a high degree of pretension in Roland's debut appearance, not to mention what seemed like thousands of unnecessary adverbs. I removed as much of this hollow blather as I could and do not regret a single cut made in that regard. In other places, invariably those where I'd been seduced in forgetting the writing seminar ideas by some particularly entrancing piece of story, I was able to let the writing almost entirely alone, save for the usual bits of revision any writer needs to do. As I have pointed out in another context, only God gets it right the first time. But other changes included aligning the tales beginning with the Dark Tower's ending, which I'm not going to say anything more on right now for sort of fear of spoilers, because if you haven't read the Dark Tower, the final volume of the series yet, it could potentially sort of ruin it. And I don't want to do that. But those changes, as well as... Um, cleaning up continuity errors, uh, adding some much needed humanization and characterization to the titular gunslinger, and I don't know, a bunch of other changes. All in all, great changes, honestly. Just very, very good changes. Just, there's always the fear that a writer's gonna go back or an editor's gonna go back, a filmmaker's gonna go back and change something to the detriment of the original vision. You know, we could sort of, go, going back to Star Wars, we can kind of see that there when George Lucas went back and, and toyed around with it and added some very, very, very thoughtful additions. We'll, we'll just put it that way. And, you know, the, it made The Gunslinger a much stronger read overall. It's still very much on the simple side compared to the books that follow and almost entirely ignores that, that fourth wall breaking narrator that seemed to kind of overshadow a lot of the events in those later volumes. But I think I actually like it more because of that. I don't think we need a Deadpool-like voice up in here. Before we get into the general plot now, I want to briefly touch on the origins of the Dark Tower novel, Dark Tower series, however you want to refer to it. Just We'll just call it the Dark Tower from here on out, which can be reduced to three inspirations. J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, Sergio Leone's The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and Robert Browning's Child Roland to the Dark Tower came. When Stephen King started writing the first story, The Gunslinger, he was a senior at the University of Maine, and he started writing it on a ream of green paper, no less. I don't know how he came across it. He said he inherited it at, in some way, shape, or form. But he, and I quote here, wanted to write a novel that contained Tolkien's sense of quest and magic set against Leon's almost absurdly majestic Western backdrop. And he was also playing with the idea of trying a long romantic novel embodying the feel, if not the exact sense, of the Browning poem, which he read in his sophomore year and which owes its title to a line from William Shakespeare's King Lear. If you haven't read the poem, it, it really reads like an outline for the entire Dark Tower series. And it's only 34 six-line stanzas. That's, that's 204 lines. That's it. 204 iambic pentameter lines to boot, but 204 lines total, and that's, that's all of it, compared to, to King's 4,250 pages of Dark Tower. As, as King wrote here, maybe it's part of growing up American. Build the tallest, dig the deepest, write the longest. But as someone who's read the entirety of Stephen King's epic, you really can see the origins in this poem, no matter how short it is. It, it really makes me wonder if, if he just had like a poster of the poem up on his wall the entire time he was reading. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I would if it was that sort of inspiration, that it was basically an outline for the entire thing. Though there's, there's one important thing to note about Child Roland to the Dark Tower came. It does not ever mention the term gunslinger. In fact, it doesn't even mention a gun. And the term wasn't in the good, the bad, and the ugly either. So, where'd that come from? Well, the first known mention of that term, the gunslinger, in any known medium, though when it was used originally it was in two words, 
was the 1920 silent film Drag Harlan, written by H.P. Keeler and Charles Alden Seltzer, neither of whom I've heard of before looking this up. And it, it seems to be that the gunslinger, the term, was a revision of the terms gunfighter and gunman. You know, just another one of those gun blah, give it gun noun, I don't know. <laughs> Though since uh, its creation has become one of the most popular versions of that sort of phrase, including before King ever wrote the Dark Tower series. Regardless, however Stephen King picked it up, however it got into his consciousness, the use of the term gave us what very well may be the best first line in all of literature. The man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed. Why is this so good? Well, Ryan A. Ross, in a post to his Ray Publishing WordPress, broke it down in far more detail than I ever could. So I'm going to include some of his points here, but I'm, I, you know, I'm only going to you include like the most basis details. I really suggest you go give his blog a read because it's it's great and it provides a lot of detail and it's really worth the read. I included the link below, so be sure to go check it out. But to pull from his argument, this opening line offers a statement of eternal principle that evil flees before good. It's also a statement of simple fact that raises far more questions than it answers, while being a statement of parried facts, that is, two complete sentences compounded and magnified. What more, it's a statement to introduce voice, as it offers no proper nouns, only mysterious ambiguity, and works as a statement to establish mood, and a statement as a reference. It brings anticipation, expectation, and sets the stage. The two men are in the desert, but they're not together. Finally, it's also a statement of simple fact laced with significance. And this bit is something a little lost in the 2003 revision as King removed the capitalization of the words black and gunslinger that were seen in the original versions. As Ross put it, King laid out what the whole book, the whole Dark Tower series for that matter, was about. A gunslinger who pursued the root of evil in his world. And that is pretty much the overarching plot of the Dark Tower. I mean, if we really boiled it down to like one or two sentences, that is what the Dark Tower is about. Though, to me especially, the, the very first short story, The Gunslinger, is about a whole lot more than that. Especially because it plays with time in a way that none of the other short stories do. First, uh, from the present, then to the near past, then to the far past, and back around again. A sort of pattern foreshadowing the entire series of novels. This story also really works to set the stage for what is to come, as though it seems to be set in the distant past with the gunslinger, the, the sort of western jive, you know, the fact that he, he, he seems like a cowboy, and there's this desert town and whatnot. But it's clearly not because right when he gets into town, there's mention of a honky-tonk playing Hey Jude, which, if you didn't know, was written by Paul McCartney in 1968, long after the idea of the Wild West and cowboys was relegated solely to the sanctity of Hollywood, implying that this is not set in the far past as one would have thought, but actually, potentially, in the future, after some sort of fallout of sorts, which is hinted at not just in this story, but throughout the series. But that Western feel is prevalent, and it continues to be prevalent, throughout every, every piece of work in the Dark Tower series. And it's what inspired today's pairing. Hockstatter's Slow and Low, served straight up in pharmacies and saloons since the 1800s. Union made with straight rye whiskey, raw honey, navel orange, rock candy, and bitters. This was an interesting one for me. I looked around for something very saloon-like, and what I got was this, which looks like a regular whiskey, right? And But it's 84 proof, so it's a little bit on the strong side. I was expecting a bit of a punch in the stomach. Now, I tried this last week when I first purchased this for, the, for this dissection, and I gotta tell you, I was a bit taken aback by it. Uh, because it is really, really good. It's sweet. And I guess you can expect that 
from the bitters and that inclusion of rock candy, right? It's it tastes like it tastes like candy. It tastes sort of like Pernell, that anise kind of flavoring to it, like a little bit of a licorice. It is amazing. And maybe this is what Roland drinks in Tull when he's there sitting at the saloon. Maybe this is what they drank in all ages in you know out in the Wild West. I don't know, but if this is what they're drinking, I understand it. But I also expect that they really got bad hangovers because the sweetness is this. It's a little overwhelming. It, again, it's good, but I don't know what kind of hangover that would give. Sort of reminds me of getting drunk off of white wine. If you drink too much of that, and I think it'd be very easy to drink too much of it at 84 proof. But let's get back to the Gunslinger. While the Gunslinger gives us the magnificent Battle of Tull and all that surrounds it, which, which rivals anything out of most Westerns I've seen or read, the Way Station, the second story in the collection, gives us Jake, or at least a version of him, which long term is far more important to the series and far more important to this book really as a whole. Though we don't quite know that just yet. But Jake helps us realize that the Gunslinger's world is not our world. It's not a far-flung future version of our world. It's not a version of our world in the past. It is a parallel world. It's a world that exists on a separate plane from our own. An alternate dimension of sorts, though I don't think that's quite right. How do we know this? Well, quotes like this one uh, kind of make it obvious that Jake is from our New York, our version of New York, our reality. Just listen to this. There was a place, the one before this one, a high place with lots of rooms and a patio where you could look at tall buildings and water. There was a statue that stood in the water. A statue in the water. Yes, a lady with a crown and a torch and, I think, a book. Are you making this up? That was a conversation between Jake and Roland if you didn't quite get it through my terrible voice acting. But while we're in this area, I want to pull another quote, which has absolutely nothing to do with the quote I just read, but it's probably other than the opening line and another line that we will get to shortly. It might be my favorite quote from this entire first novel. Here it is. When traitors are called heroes, or heroes traitors, he supposed in his frowning way, dark times must have fallen. I want that on a bumper sticker. Please, somebody send that to me if it exists. Uh, but what I really truly appreciate about the way station is it really starts to flesh out Roland as more of a lover than really a fighter. And we had that sort of implied in the opening act in The Gunslinger, um, and even more so in the 2003 rewrite, which gave a bit of extra warmth during the battle in which he relentlessly and ruthlessly kind of slaughters everyone at the end of the book. In this, in the original, he just kind of went a little nuts on them. And it was, it was hard to read and it was extremely cold. This 2003 revision makes him warmer, makes him more the role in that we will see throughout the rest of the series. He's still on the colder side, goldish side, but definitely better, definitely more humanistic. And this is, I think, really, rather important because in both The Gunslinger and the third story in this collection, The Oracle in the Mountains, we get some um, rather peculiar instances of him uh, coldly allowing himself to be used, I guess would be the right term, um, for sex in exchange for information. First in this scene with Alice, she stared at him, the anger dying. It was replaced with speculation, then with a high, wet gleam he had seen before. The rickety building ticked thoughtfully to itself. A dog barked brayingly, far away, the gunslinger waited. She saw his knowledge and the gleam was replaced by hopelessness, by a dumb need that had no mouth. I guess maybe you know my price, she said. I got an itch I used to be able to take care of, but now I can't. And this one, with the oracle, which also occurs while he's high as a kite on LSD. Please. The oracle wept. Don't be cold, it's always so cold here. Hands slipping over his flesh, manipulating. Got lighting him on fire, pulling him, drawing. A perfumed black crevice, wet and warm. No, dry, cold, sterile. 
Have a touch of mercy, Gunslinger. Ah, please, I cry your favor. Mercy! Through the Oracle, of course, who sits in a ring rather reminiscent of Stonehenge, the next chapter of the Dark Tower, the drawing of the three, is foretold. Now, I'm going to pull a few quotes here from this section of the Oracle in the Mountains um, and cut out a bit of the back and forth in between. So, um, you, you should be able to follow along, but just in case you, you're expecting a direct quote here, there's going to be a, several uh, little ellipses. So, just as a heads up. Let's see here. Three. This is the number of your fate. Three? Yes. Three is mystic. Three stands at the heart of your quest. Which three? The first is young, dark-haired. He stands on the brink of robbery and murder. A demon has infested him. The name of the demon is heroin. The second? She comes on wheels. I see no more. The third? Death. But not for you. The boy, that would be Jake, is your gate to the man in black. The man in black is your gate to the three. The three are your way to the dark tower. Which is all pretty great foreshadowing, told in a, in a pretty memorable, pretty unique way. You know, it's a drug-addled premonition. And it would be great, except for the fact that it's, it's blemished in a way by the fact that we get something very similar in the very last portion of this novel, uh, The Gunslinger and the Man in Black, to use its updated title. Uh, granted, in this section, it's read th through tarot cards rather than an oracle, um, but it's, it's altogether too similar. Just, just listen to a couple of these quotes here. The Hanged Man. You, Gunslinger, are the Hanged Man, plodding ever onward toward your goal over the pits of Na'ar. You've already dropped one co-traveler into that pit, have you not? The sailor! Note the clear brow, the hairless cheeks, the wounded eyes. He drowns, gunslinger, and no one throughout the line. The boy Jake. The third card was turned. A baboon stood grinningly astride a young man's shoulder. The young man's face was turned up, a grimace of stylized dread and horror on his features. Looking more closely, the gunslinger saw the baboon held a whip. The prisoner. He turned the fourth card. A woman with a shawl over her head sat spinning at a wheel. To the gunslinger's dazed eyes, she appeared to be smiling craftily and sobbing at the same time. The Lady of Shadows. Could one or the other of these not have been cut? I mean, I, I suppose that would give one or the other very little story structure. But then why was it written this way in the first place? I glossed over... Jake's death in the slow mutants there. Just, yeah, I, I know I did. Um, since his introduction, right, from his introduction right in the way station, it was teased. Well, the, the whole, you're going to kill me lines that he throws at Roland. And the on the nose foreshadowing of Roland's duh, dove? Hawk. Hawk David. You know, his sacrifice, though, which, don't get me wrong, that was a cool scene absolutely brutal just, just just the way he took down court but it, it was hard not to expect the parallels that followed still even with this being my second read through of the series i was hoping that jake's fate would have been changed in this 2003 revision that king had revised it enough that he lived though that sort of a change certainly wouldn't make sense and would drastically alter Roland's character as it's as it's li him literally jumping over Jake, dangling from the trestle of of this of this railroad track, and going after the man in black that it is most pivotal for his character within this novel. I mean, that's that's probably the epitome of characterization within the Gunslinger. We already knew it by this point, but it's really cemented here. Roland will do everything. Go over anyone, sacrifice anything to fulfill his quest, to fulfill his search and hunt for the Dark Tower. And so Jake's final line of dialogue remains as it is. Go then. There are other worlds than these. Which is not a typo, despite the fact that it gives my editor brain sort of an aneurysm. But, it, it, you know, it's also perhaps the second best line in all of the 
book. At least, the second most memorable. So much so that I actually thought it might be another homage, though I haven't found anything indicating it as such. I don't, I don't think it's an homage to anything, just something that King sort of came up with. And as the Oracle foretold, Jake's death is Roland's gateway to the, the Man in Black. And I think that this particular instance is the very first example of a Stephen King book ending in not such a great way. It, it, it's something of a letdown. I think this is really the first one that we can really strongly consider a letdown in the Stephen King canon. I appreciate it for what, I, for what it is. I really do. And I understand that it's, it's not really a true ending for a novel because, again, this is supposed to be part one of seven of an extremely long novel. But, you know, at the time that this was released, people didn't necessarily know that. Especially I mean, if you were reading it as short stories, you might have expected another short story to follow. Or you, were, you read that original first novel, if there wasn't an indication that something else was coming, you might have been like, what is this? You know, it leads... It leaves off on such an opening, like a setup, like a cliffhanger. Not really a very astounding cliffhanger at that. It just sort of stops. After all these pages, all this journey, all this sacrifice, what we get is not this epic battle, this epic shootout, this confrontation between the gunslinger and the man in black. What we get instead is this philosophical debate. All be it an interesting one. Let me, let me pull a quote here. Could it be that everything we can perceive from the microscopic virus to the distant horsehead nebula is contained in one blade of grass that may have existed for only a single season in an alien time flow? What if that blade should be cut off by a scythe? When it begins to die, would the rot seep into our own universe, our own lives, turning everything yellow and brown and desiccated? Perhaps it's already begun to happen. We say the world has moved on. Maybe we really mean that it has begun to dry up. Which dovetails rather nicely into an explanation for why the tower is so important and why Roland, our gunslinger, is on a quest to save it, as the man in black says. Yet suppose further, suppose that all worlds, all universes met in a single nexus, a single pylon, a tower, and within it, a stairway perhaps rising to the godhead itself. Would you dare climb to the top, Gunslinger? Could it be that somewhere above all of endless reality there exists a room? You dare not. There's more after this, but to really summarize the ending, Roland walks to the beach and waits, which if I recall correctly is exactly where the drawing of the three picks up, but where we're going to leave off of this, uh, rather uninspiring and disappointing ending. Which is a really good segue into the 2017 film The Dark Tower, directed by Nicolaj Arcel, who also contributed to the screenplay, along with Akiva Goldman, Jeff Pinkner, and Anders Thomas Jensen. The Dark Tower, by the way, you know, we, we I gotta give it some credit because it is the very definition of development hell. Because people tried for years to get this thing onto the silver screen, including the likes of J.J. Abrams and Ron Howard, who maintains a producer credit on the final film, and who originally wanted to see the entire saga played out over three films and two seasons of TV, which I don't think that's going to happen, at least not in the current iteration. Now, The Dark Tower isn't an exact direct adaptation of The Gunslinger, which I, I mentioned earlier, but rather a combination of it and uh, elements from some of the other books. Notably, the second through fourth novels and the subsequent interim novel, The Wind Through the Keyhole. Actually, it's a sequel of sorts to the entire saga, and to The Shining, actually, in, in a few ways. And I originally planned on doing an episode of the Stephen King dissection solely dedicated to it. But after watching it, I don't think I'm going to do that. In fact, I, I, I may talk about it again when we reach the conclusion of the Dark Tower saga, but uh, I think from here on out, I'm never going to mention it again because it's just, it's not a good movie. I said the ending to the book was a disappointment. No, this is a disappointment, though maybe not on the surface. 
For one thing, the casting is perfect. Yes, there was some gripe about Idris Elba, though there really shouldn't have been any because he's a fantastic actor. But Matthew McConaughey, he is sheer perfection and exactly how I would have pictured Randall Flagg if I didn't already have a comic book version of him in my head. Some of the dialogue is pitch perfect as well, like in this scene. Do they have guns in your world? Yeah. And bullets? Are they as rare as they are here? You're gonna like Earth a lot. Which is rather sadly telling of America, isn't it? And this scene too. Here. What is this? Thank you. Thanks. Hot dog. Savages. That one, which sounds more like something Guardians of the Galaxy's Drax would utter than anyone else, got a heck of a laugh out of me, I gotta say. The movie also presented the Gunslinger's otherworldly reloading in a beautiful fashion, I gotta hand it to them. They did try to establish a massive world full of wonder, but it unfortunately just wasn't so wondrous. A genuinely frustrating notion as the Gunslinger is a fairly straightforward tale, so you would think that an adaptation could be fairly straightforward as well. But no, they decided to make a series of changes, the most egregious of which, to me, is changing the, the sort of narrative focal point from the gunslinger to Jake. Framing it from Jake's perspective gives the story a more young adult feel than I ever could have expected. Actually, if you compare this to any of the myriad other YA movies that have spawned from the last decade, it's practically a carbon copy right down to the cinematography, but especially the plot. Down on his luck, kid gets a break, meets a mysterious, powerful stranger, learns he has special powers. The shine is strong in this one. Shine, psychic powers. And is the one. Trouble ensues, happy ending. Happy-ish, you know, I suppose, given Jake's mom was Burned to a crisp, and the man in black has perhaps the lamest death imaginable. And did that last shot not feel like the ending of an episode of Sliders to anyone else? I mean, come on. When all was said and done, The Dark Tower was a critical and box office disappointment, earning just something like 113 million and uh, renounced as both boring and simplistic. So while there were talks of a sequel, I really wouldn't hold my breath on that. And given the events of the film itself, I'm not sure what a sequel would even entail. Maybe instead hope that the announced Amazon reboot actually pans out. Anyway, while the film adaptation of The Gunslinger is not so hot, the comic adaptation of The Gunslinger is really actually not that bad. Published as part of the ongoing The Dark Tower series, originally released by Marvel starting in 2007 before transitioning over to Gallery 13, these volumes, published between 2011 and 2012, were written by Robin Firth and Peter David, with art by Sean Phillips, Luke Ross, Michael Lark, Lawrence Campbell, Alex Maleev, and Richard Eisenhoff. Quite a, a collection of talent right there. The story is told over three five-issue volumes. The Battle of Tull, which retells parts of the Gunslinger. The Way Station, which includes bits from both that story and the Oracle and the Mountains. And The Man in Black, which goes through both the Slow Mutants and the Gunslinger and the Man in Black. Which is sort of funny because, despite consolidating the storylines, they still add a bunch of material or asides from other books, like, like a meeting between the Man in Black and one of the Slow Mutants. Or Jake wandering through the mountain cave on his own and much, much more. There's also two additional volumes under Marvel's The Gunslinger sort of umbrella that covers material from the later books that take place before the events of The Gunslinger. The Journey Begins and The Little Sisters of Illyria, both of which we'll cover in other dissections. But because it's part of a series that chronicles Roland's ascendancy to gunslinger status from, from the very beginning, from his very childhood. The flashbacks that occur in, St in Stephen King's original novel and the original short stories, they're basically missing from this comic adaptation. Uh, they'd already been covered in earlier issues, so why cover them again? 
And that narrator, the narrative voice that you see here, is far more akin to that fourth wall breaking speaker that we would get in later books as well, the one that I mentioned earlier. But we'll get to that, you know, another day. Generally, the comic format allows us some fun narrative devices, though it also means a cliffhanger of sorts every 20 odd pages, which shifts the plot a bit in various almost mostly mostly subtle ways. Unfortunately, the comic's timeline is almost nonsensical at times. It's a little weird given how straightforward it otherwise is and how straightforward the gunslinger's tale is. And which also means that we get that opening titular amazing line in the middle of an issue. It's a little awkward. Side note, it was also spoken by a disembodied voice in the film. The man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed. While watching it, I wasn't entirely sure who spoke it. I'm still not exactly 100% sure. You know, I, I deep dove into the internet trying to find a solid answer, but there seems to be a lot of back and forth and nobody really seemed to nail it. If I had to guess, I'd say Claudia Kim, who just really wasn't well served in this film. Let's, let's just put it that way. The comic also messes with Roland's almost otherwise magical ability to reload. The, the thing that I celebrated about the film, as he's shown to create distractions time and again in order to do so. Really, he, he just generally seems more inept. I mean, he cuts his hand open as if he's the idiot from the edge rather than an amazing, almost supernatural gunslinger. Meanwhile, in the film adaptation, he's, he's basically bullseye with a knife. You know, it's very different takes on the same character, and neither of which are the character from the book. It's very odd. Though the writing in the comic at other times, I have to say, is almost brilliant, with, with additional Draxisms helping to break up the dialogue, and going full circle, the comic makes an amusing reference to the Lord of the Rings, one I, I really truly appreciated. You know, I forgot to mention it, the film includes many Easter eggs to other, uh, to other Stephen King works, uh, including more direct connections to The Shining, like a picture of the Overlook Hotel and a possible Grady Twins cameo. There's also a Pennywise from It amusement park ride, an appearance of the novel Misery's Child from, obviously, Misery, the Rita Hayworth poster from the Shawshank Redemption, a portal labeled 1408, just like the short story turned John Cusack thriller, and even possible nods to Christine, Mr. Mercedes, Children of the Corn, and Cujo. Speaking of the Shawshank Redemption, this has turned into a rather long episode of the Stephen King dissections, and it's starting to get really hot in here, and I'm a little bit sleepy because I'm recording this on a Sunday night after a bit of a vacation. So I'm gonna call it there, and uh, our very next episode is going to be on Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption. I've read it, I haven't yet rewatched the film, but uh, I'm looking forward to doing that because that is one of probably the best Stephen King film adaptations yet. It's one of them. I don't know if it's the one, but it's one of them. <laughs> Remember, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like it, be sure to comment below, please subscribe to the channel, please head on over to drunkonwriting.com and, uh, you know, help out the channel, sign up there to vote on what episodes you'd like to see, vote on what comes next, and, uh, you know, just let me hear your thoughts. And you can follow me over on Twitter and on Instagram at drunkonwriting. No G. Until next time, cheers. Oh, wait. Ho oh, ho. Cheers. You keep on writing.